I'm Grant Blank. I'm the Survey Research Fellow here at the Oxford Internet Institute at the University of Oxford. My research primarily is about the social, political, and cultural effects of the Internet. Hyperconnectivity means that people can communicate much more easily with each other. That's a big deal for friendships um, and other social relationships. It means that people can form friendships across distances and maintain them across distances in ways that they never could before. On the other hand, despite the fact that uh, hyperconnectivity makes it easier to stay in touch with your friends, there's no real evidence that the number of friends that people have today is any different than it has been at any time throughout history. Everyone's still limited by the amount of time they have in the day, their emotional energy, the attention span that they have for particular friendships. And those seem to be pretty hard limits. Now there's some business implications to hyperconnectivity as well. One implication is that people are going to be able to spend money on businesses and find out about business products in ways that they couldn't have before. Now the downside of this for a business is that customer service is going to be much more important. It's easier for people to track a uh, bad customer service interaction, to post in fact the entire contents of a customer service interaction on the internet that anyone who does a search for a particular company or a particular product is likely to find. So it makes problems that businesses have much more visible at the same time as it makes it easier for people to buy products from them. Hyperconnectivity is a particular domain of the young. If you want to look at where things are going, look at what the young are doing now. At the same time, if you look at who adopts internet products and particularly hyperconnectivity, you'll find this is not only the young but also the well-educated and the wealthy. The wealthy are a particularly desirable group, of course, for business because they have money. They can drop several hundred pounds on a product and uh, this is not an uncomfortable thing for them. They can try something out and see if it works. So that's one of the reasons they're early adopters. They have less risk. Well-educated people are going to be sort of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, um, they buy a lot of products. Um, on the other hand, Education makes them discriminating as consumers. They tend to consult reviews and so they're sensitive to the quality of the product and the suitability for the purpose. Um, that's going to make it harder perhaps for businesses to produce shoddy products uh, and push them out into the marketplace. Developing countries have not historically had very complex or very well developed communication systems. And that's, of course, the reason why mobile phones have had such an enormous impact because they're not replacing landlines. They're really just the first device that allows people to communicate to anyone anywhere in the country. On the other hand, the bandwidth that's available over a smartphone is relatively limited. And I think ultimately that's going to limit the long-term impact of mobile phones. To move to the next stage, at some point, these countries are going to need to lay down fiber, connect it to businesses, offices, and homes. Now, fiber is expensive, and that means it's going to compete with other needs for things like health, education, um, and other sorts of infrastructure that any uh, developing country needs. That's going to be hard for fiber to make it to the top of that list. Now, education is one of the issues that's also particularly important here when we're thinking about hyperconnectivity. Education is the basis for a lot of modern jobs. That means that governments are going to have to invest in education, in schools, in teachers, in training teachers, and those are going to be expensive, um, but they're necessary because education is the fundamental component of modern high-tech jobs. <laughs>